Well, hello and welcome to this series of lectures on pulmonary pathophysiology, that is, the function of the diseased lung. My name is John West and these lectures form a companion series to the, my previous one on, respir on respiratory physiology. That series dealt with the normal lung and now we're going to be turning to the lung in disease. The material is based on lectures that we've given to the medical students at the University of California, San Diego over the years, and it broadly follows my little book, Pulmonary Pathophysiology, The Essentials. Although the lecture format means that we can dwell at greater length on some of the more difficult concepts, and also, of course, we can use far more illustrations than we can in a book. Now, where shall we start? Well, we learn about pulmonary function in disease by doing pulmonary function tests. And so a good place to start is the have a look at the pulmonary function tests themselves. But I should say at the outset that this is a very large subject and I can't possibly cover it all. And so I'm going to concentrate on two of the most important tests, the forced expiration and arterial blood gases. And we're going to look at the other tests uh, uh, more briefly. Now, one of the most important tests uh, in pulmonary function is a forced expiration, as shown here. Uh, it's shown actually using a spirometer, although these days we use electronic equipment, but this is a useful way of demonstrating what happens. The subject takes an inspiration to total lung capacity and then breathes out as hard and as far as he can and the, we plot the, ex, the volume against time, as you can see here. And the total volume exhaled is called the forced vital capacity, or the FVC, and the volume exhaled in the first second is called the forced expiratory volume, or the FEV1. Now sometimes we measure the vital capacity with a slow expiration and it tends to be somewhat larger and that's why the convention is we call this the fast vital capacity or FVC. Now let's look at three typical patterns of this forced expiration. On the left we see the normal pattern and there you can see in this example the patient exhaled uh, five liters altogether uh, and four liters were exhaled in the first second, the FEV1. And so the ratio of FEV to FEC was 80%. Now, of course, there's some variation around the uh, sizes of the FEV and the FVC, depending on the stature and the age and the gender of the patient. Uh, but the, the percentage is normally about 80% in young normal subjects. Now let's look at the obstructive pattern, and we would expect to see something like this in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. And you can see, first of all, that the total amount exhaled was considerably reduced. And this, as we'll see later, is because the diseased airways close prematurely at the end of the expiration. But more striking, the forced expiratory volume is extremely small and that's because of the airway obstruction. In fact, in this example, the FEV is only 42% of the FVC, very different from the normal subject where the percentage was 80. Now let's look at restrictive disease over here. We would see this in a patient with diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, for example. And you'll see that both volumes are small, and that's because the lung is stiff and works at a low lung volume. But very remarkably, the FEV is an unusually large proportion of the FVC. So here, the FEV, FVC percentage was 90, as opposed to the normal value of 80%. Now sometimes we also make another measurement on the forced expiratory uh, curve, and that is we calculate the forced expiratory flows. And to do that, we take the middle half of the expired volume and we, we draw a line through the points and that gives us the forced expiratory flow with the subscript 25 to 75%. And in this example, from a normal subject, you can see that it was about 3.5 liters per second. 
In obstructive disease, it was considerably reduced at 1.4 litres per second, but in restrictive disease, it was high again at about 3.7, and it turns out that the forced expiratory flows uh, reflect the measurements of FEV and FVC quite well. Now, a very important measurement is the expiratory flow volume curve. And to get this information, the patient goes through the same maneuver, but this time we plot the flow rate against lung volume, as shown here. And a very interesting and important feature of this flow volume curve is that during most of the expiration, the flow is independent of effort. And we'll say more about that in a moment. But first, let's look at the patterns in obstructive, normal, and restrictive disease. And you can see, and here, we've plotted the flow volume curves on the absolute lung volume. Now, normally that information is not actually available, but it gives us additional information and uh, it, it uh, uh, helps to explain what's happening. You can see that the patient with obstructive disease began and ended his expiration at a high lung volume and also that the pattern shows a slightly scooped out appearance compared with the normal. The patient with restrictive disease began and ended his expiration at very low lung volumes. And remarkably, as you'll see, the flow rate during most of the expiration actually exceeded that of the normal subject at the same lung volume. Now, one of the most important features, as I mentioned, is this, this effort independence of, ex, of flow rate. And this is caused by what's called dynamic compression of the airways. Now, we talked about this in some detail in the respiratory physiology lectures, but it's so important that I'm going to recap it here uh, using this uh, series of drawings. Let's look at the situation before the subject takes his inspiration to vital capacity. Here he is at FRC, and since there's no flow, all the pressures are zero, atmospheric, mouth, alveolar, and somewhere along the airway. The intrapleural pressure, this is meant to be the chest cage around here, the intrapleural pressure is about minus five centimeters of water, and of course that's determined by the recoil pressure of the lung. Now look at what happens during inspiration. The inspiratory muscles contract, and the result is that the alveolar pressure falls to minus two centimeters of water, flow begins, and the pressures are zero at the mouth, minus two in the alveoli, and minus one somewhere along the airway. Now, what about the intrapleural pressure? Well, if we consider the situation right at the beginning of inspiration, before lung volume has changed, then the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure is the same, five centimeters of water. So that enables us to say that the intrapleural pressure at the beginning is going to be minus seven centimeters of water. Now let's look at what we have at the end of inspiration. No flow, so all the airway pressures are zero, but the, the intrapleural pressure now is more negative because the lung has a higher lung volume and therefore more elastic recoil. And notice that we've also calculated the pressure difference across the airway. Here we have a pressure of five centimeters of water holding the airway open. Here it's six centimeters of water and here eight centimeters of water holding the airway open. And I should say here that we're assuming that the pressure around the airways is the same as the intrapleural pressure which is a bit of an oversimplification, but is certainly justified in the context of this. Now, what about the forced expiration? The expiratory muscles contract vigorously, the alveolar pressure jumps up to 38 centimeters of water, and somewhere along the airway, the pressure would be half that, plus 19 centimeters of water. Now, if we assume that we're looking at the vo lung volume at the beginning, of the expiration, then the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure is going to be the same as it was here. So we can calculate that the intrapleural pressure is going to be plus 30. And now look what's happening at the airway here. 
we've got a pressure of plus 30 outside, a pr pressure of plus 19 inside, so we've got 11 centimetres of water tending to close the airway. And the airway is compressed, and uh, under those conditions, it turns out that flow is determined not by alveolar pressure minus mouth pressure, as you might think, but alveolar pressure minus the pressure in the airway at the compression point here. Now this pressure difference is 38 minus 30, that is the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure, that's determined by lung volume. So no matter how hard the subject tries to exhale, he can't increase his flow rate because if, for example, he contracts his expiratory muscles more vigorously, alveolar pressure jumps up to 48, intrapleural pressure will increase to 40 and we'll have exactly the same pressure difference. So that's, the, that's a brief explanation of why flow is effort independent and uh, it's important to be clear about that. Now this dynamic compression of the airways is exaggerated in some conditions, for example in COPD, and that's for three reasons. One is that the resistance of the small airways is increased because of the disease and therefore the pressure is lost more rapidly as we go towards the mouth from the alveoli. The second reason is that in COPD the difference between alveolar and intrapleural pressure is less. The lung is more compliant because of the destruction of the architecture of the lung. And so that pressure difference is less and so dynamic compression is more of a problem. And finally, the airways are not held open by the radial traction of the lung parenchyma around them as they normally are and therefore they're more liable to collapse. And that's shown in this cartoon here. Here we have the airway caliber in emphysema and fibrosis. The normal situation is shown here where we have plenty of alveolar walls around with radial traction holding the airway open. But in emphysema, many of the alveolar walls are destroyed and so the airway is more prone to collapse. And in fibrosis, the opposite occurs. In fibrosis, you have fibrous tissue, scar tissue around the airway, which is tending to pull it open. And therefore, that is why we have these relatively high flow rates during expiration. Now here's a drawing that gives us additional information about this dynamic compression of the airways. And we're showing the collapse point here. And notice that this divides the airways into two parts. You've got the proximal airways near the mouth and the distal airways distal to the point of collapse. And remember that the flow rate is determined by the pressure in the alveoli minus the pressure at, inside the airway at the collapse point. So this means that what we're looking at towards the end of the flow volume curve is the contribution made by the very small airways. And so the further we go down the flow volume curve, the smaller the airways that count. What happens is that as we continue the expiration, the collapse point moves distally. Why does it do that? Because the resistance of the airways increases the lower, lung, the lower the lung volume, the higher the resistance. And as a result, the, the pressure is lost more rapidly from the alveoli as we go towards the mouth. And therefore, the collapse point moves peripherally. And therefore, the further we are down the flow volume curve, the more we're looking at the very small airways. And we can show this on uh, this diagram here where we're showing the flow rates during the exhaled vital capacity, the normal pattern here, the pattern in obstructive disease here. And you'll see we can calculate the maximal flow rate at different points in the expiration. For example, here we're looking at the flow rate, maximum flow rate, after 75% of the vital capacity has been exhaled. And now we're beginning to look at very small airways towards the end of the forced expiration. Now there's another test that we occasionally do, and that is the inspiratory flow volume curve. And these are shown over here. Uh, here we've got the normal lung with the broken line and COPD in the red line. 
Here's the normal expiratory flow volume curve, and here are the inspiratory flow volume curves. There's no dynamic compression of the airways during inspiration. In fact, the airways are held open during inspiration. But occasionally, we look at the inspiratory flow volume curves to see if there's a change in the pattern, and classically, this occurs with upper airway obstruction, and that's shown here. The, an example would be tracheal compression by lymph glands outside the trachea or uh, by a neoplasm outside the trachea, something like that. And you can see that the inspiratory flow volume curve is flattened here, and this is a very useful diagnostic point for picking up uh, obstruction, upper, uh, upper airway obstruction, particularly tracheal obstruction. Now there's one more measurement that I should mention, and that is the peak expiratory flow rate. This is very easy to do because you can buy a very simple piece of equipment that will allow the patient to measure his peak expiratory flow rate and uh, make a note of it in his diary. It's not a particularly repeatable measurement. It depends on the patient's effort, but it's particularly useful in patients with severe airway obstruction, for example in asthma, where the patient is being treated with bronchodilators and the physician would like to know what the progress of the patient is. And so the patient can, uh, uh, can record his peak expiratory flow rate several times during the day, the week or so on, and show the information to the physician at the next visit and a decision can be made about uh, bronchodilator therapy. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the forced expiration. Very important uh, measurement, and we will be using that extensively in the following lectures. But now I'd like to turn to the second very important uh, pulmonary function test, and that is the arterial blood gases. And let me uh, give you a little light relief here by telling you that when I was a, a uh, medical resident in the middle 1950s, we couldn't measure arterial blood gases. Can you believe that? Uh, there were no blood gases available. The equipment had not been developed. Instead, we were taught to look at the conjunctiva of the eye to see if we could detect cyanosis. Sounds absolutely medieval today, but that's uh, what it was like in the bad old days. Now, fortunately, we, have, we can measure arterial blood gases easily. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at the PO2, the PCO2, and the pH. So let's start with the PO2, and whenever I see a PO2, I like to have the oxygen dissociation curve at the back of my mind. And here's a nice curve showing us three anchor points on the oxygen dissociation curve. First of all, we've got the arterial PO2, which is round about 100 and the oxygen saturation is about 97, 98%. That's the first anchor point. The second one is the mixed venous blood in the pulmonary artery, for example, where the PO2 is about 40 and the oxygen saturation is 75%. And thirdly, we have what's called the P50. That's the partial pressure of oxygen for 50% saturation and the normal value is about 27 millimeters of mercury. So those are three anchor points, if you like, on the oxygen dissociation curve, and I think they're helpful to keep. Uh, I remember those, it's not very difficult to remember, and it's helpful if someone gives us a, a, a PO2 of say 50, well we know then it's going to be just above the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, value for the mixed venous blood and so on. Now the oxygen dissociation curve is shifted, as I'm sure you know, by various factors. And here we've got the oxygen dissociation curve, the saturation on this axis, the PO2 on this axis, and we can see that it is shifted by several factors, four factors. An increase in temperature, PCO2, hydrogen ion concentration, and 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, all shift the curve to the right, and they therefore decrease the oxygen uh, affinity for the hemoglobin. And the way I remember this is that exercising muscle is hot, has a high PCO2, and has an increased hydrogen ion concentration, both because of the PCO2 and perhaps the lactate, and it's valuable, it's uh, advantageous for exercising muscle 
to have a reduced oxygen affinity of the hemoglobin so that the hemoglobin can unload more oxygen. So that's the way I remember those. Now let's look at abnormal PO2 values and let's look at the four causes of hypoxemia. And those are hypoventilation, diffusion impairment, shunt and ventilation perfusion inequality. And let's first look at hypoventilation briefly. Now, as I'm sure you remember, there is an important equation that tells us about the PCO2 in, this, in hypoventilation. And we can use that and another equation to calculate what happens to the alveolar PO2. And the equation is shown here. This is the alveolar ventilation equation, which reminds us that there is a close relationship, an inverse relationship between the PCO2 and the level of alveolar ventilation for a given CO2 production. Now the CO2 production, of course, is determined by the metabolism of the peripheral tissues. Doesn't change much at rest, changes on exercise, but at rest it doesn't change much. So in general, there's an inverse relationship between PCO2 and alveolar ventilation. We don't need to worry about the constant here. So what this means is that if, for example, we double the alveolar ventilation, the PCO2 will halve, or if we halve the alveolar ventilation, as in hypoventilation, then the PCO2 will double. Now we can use that equation together with the alveolar gas equation shown here to calculate the alveolar PO2 with hypoventilation. And here's the alveolar gas equation. It says the alveolar PO2 is equal to the inspired value minus the PCO2 divided by the respiratory exchange ratio used to be called the respiratory quotient. That's the, ox that's the CO2 output divided by the oxygen consumption, and the normal value is about 0.8 at rest. There's also another factor, but it's very small. It's only two or three millimeters of mercury with the patient breathing air, and so we're going to ignore that. So let's use this equation to calculate what the alveolar PO2 is in hypoventilation when, say, we halve the alveolar ventilation. Well, if we halve the alveolar ventilation from its, the, the normal value of PCO2, which is 40, will increase to 80, will double the PCO2. So now we've got a PCO2 of 80, and now we can say that the alveolar PO2 is equal to the inspired value. Now, hold it a moment. Do we remember how to calculate the inspired PO2? It's very easy, of course. We take the barometric pressure, 760, subtract the water vapor pressure, 47, that gives us 713, multiply by 21%, and that gives us 150. So I, I'm presuming that you recall those uh, fundamental pieces of respiratory physiology. So here we've got an equation where the alveolar PO2 is equal to 150 minus 80 over 0.8, which is 100, gives us an alveolar PO2 of 50. So that's, a, that's the way in which we look at the fall in alveolar and therefore arterial PO2 in a situation of hypoventilation. Now here's a nice little problem. If we wanted to bring that alveolar P PO2 back to the normal value by giving the patient some enriched oxygen to breathe, what oxygen concentration would we need? In other words, what we want to do is raise that alveolar PO2 from 50 to 100, and by inspection you can see that the way to do that would be to increase the inspired PO2 from 150 to 200. So the question is, what oxygen concentration do we need to give us an inspired PO2 of 200? And that's shown here. What we need is an inspired PO2 of 200 millimeters of mercury, and we use the relationship that the partial pressure is equal to the fractional concentration times the dry gas pressure, and that gives us a fractional concentration 200 over 713 is 0.28. In other words, the inspired concentration, oxygen concentration, is only 28% to return the alveolar PO2 to the normal value when we've got severe hypoventilation. Uh, alveolar ventilation is reduced to a half. And this, the carry home message here is that if a patient is hypoventilating, it's very easy to return the alveolar and therefore the arterial PO2 to normal values 
by giving even relatively small concentrations of oxygen. Now what could be the causes of hypoventilation? Well, I'm not going to, going to go into them in detail here, but if someone asked me that, I'd have a cartoon like this at the back of my mind. I'd say, well, let's look at the respiratory centers first in the medulla. We could have drugs that depress respiration, such as barbiturates, morphine derivatives, or there could perhaps be encephalitis that uh, uh, can uh, affect the function of the medulla. Next, there could be some problem with the spinal cord dislocation, for example, of the spinal cord. Although remember that the diaphragm is innervated by cervical 3, 4, and 5, so you've got to go pretty high in the spinal cord before you're going to see uh, an interference with diaphragmatic function. Next, we go to the anterior horn cell, as in poliomyelitis. Then perhaps uh, the, the nerves going to the muscles of respiration. That could be the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, the, the neuromuscular junction here, that uh, a problem there would be myasthenia gravis. The muscles themselves, for, for example, with progressive muscular dystrophy. We could have a problem with the chest wall, for example, a chest wall which is damaged by the steering wheel during an automobile accident, crushed crush chest, and that could cause hypoventilation. And finally, obstruction to the upper, to the trachea, for example, that we mentioned before. You'll notice, by the way, that all these causes of hypoventilation are actually outside the lung itself. And so in general, if we can fix the problem outside the lung, uh, the uh, prognosis is very good. Okay, so that's enough about hypoventilation. I'm now going to move to diffusion impairment. And again, we discussed that extensively, uh, the principles of diffusion in the respiratory physiology lectures. I'm just going to recap briefly here and remind you of the time course for the PO2 in the pulmonary capillary as the oxygen is loaded in the lung. And you remember that the, ox that the blood comes in with a PO2 of about 40. The PO2 rises very rapidly so that even in one third of the time available, the PO2 of the blood has virtually reached that of alveolar gas. And there's plenty of time, plenty of diffusion in the normal lung in reserve. However, on exercise, when the contact time is reduced because of the high cardiac output, then the uh, reserve is, is less, exercise shown here. Now suppose we have a disease that thickens the blood gas barrier and therefore slows the rate of, of diffusion of oxygen across the barrier, then of course the rate of increase will be less and will come up again, along a line here. And it may be that at the end of the capillary, the PO2 of the end capillary blood has not reached that of alveolar gas. And we call that diffusion limitation, as impaired diffusion. Now what sort of disease could cause that? Well, let's look first of all at the normal blood gas barrier. Here's a nice uh, micrograph showing the pulmonary capillaries. We actually can't really see the normal blood gas barrier. It's between the capillaries here and the alveolar gas. It's really beyond the reservoir, right at the limit of resolution of the light microscope. And look what happens in disease, for example, diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. We get gross thickening of the blood gas barrier. Obviously, the diffusion of oxygen from the alveolar gas into the capillary is going to be greatly slowed. And so this is a good example of, uh, diff of impaired diffusion. Okay, let's look at the third cause of hypoxemia, which is shunt. And this refers to blood that reaches the arterial system without passing through ventilated areas of lung. Now you can have shunts within the lung. You can have an abnormal pulmonary artery, a small branch of the pulmonary artery, connected to a pulmonary, branch of a pulmonary vein. That's called arterial venous astenosis. It's a congenital condition, and uh, it's, it's, uh, we see that from time to time. Another example of a shunt would be a lung disease where you had blood flow through unventilated lung. That could occur, for example, in pulmonary edema or in pneumonia, perhaps. 
And other, other examples are outside the lung, extrapulmonary causes of shunt, for example, defects in the heart, which allow blood from the right heart to move across into the left heart. So there are a number of causes of shunt, and this can be responsible for very low PO2 values, but often the PO2 is reduced to a small extent. Now there's a very useful test for a shunt, and I want to mention that briefly, and that is to give the patient 100% oxygen to breathe and see if the arterial PO2 rises to the expected value. Shunt is the only mechanism of hypoxemia where when you give the patient 100% oxygen to breathe, the PO2 does not rise to the expected value, and the reason is shown here. Here we have a diagram showing a shunt across here. It's the normal blood flow coming through here. And of course, when the shunted blood is mixed with the normal blood, you get a decrease in oxygen concentration of the blood. Now here's a graph showing the oxygen concentration plotted against the PO2. And notice we're taking the PO2 up to very high values because we're interested in 100% uh, oxygen here. And what you see is that the upper part of this curve of oxygen concentration against PO2 has a very shallow slope. Why is that? It's because once the PO2 is round about 200 or so, all the hemoglobin uh, is bound with oxygen. And so the only oxygen that can be added to the blood in this region of the curve is dissolved oxygen. And that's the reason why the slope is so shallow. Now when we've added the shunted blood to the normal blood, we decrease the oxygen concentration. Perhaps not very much, just as, the, as much as shown here. But notice that this small decrease in oxygen concentration is reflected in a very large fall in the PO2. And so giving a patient 100% oxygen to breathe and measuring the PO2 is a very sensitive way of picking up a small shunt and that is a useful pulmonary function test from time to time. Now the fourth cause of hypoxemia is ventilation perfusion inequality. And we dealt with that at length in the respiratory physiology lectures. In fact, we spent a whole lecture talking about the subject, and it would be impossible to do it justice here. I'm going to be talking about it in the context of various lung diseases as we go through the remaining lectures, but I'm not going to deal with it anymore here because there's really not much I can say in a short time that's helpful. Now let's turn to the second measurement of the arterial blood gases, and that is the PCO2. And the PCO2 is measured, by the way, uh, by using an electrode, which is basically a, a pH electrode. And uh, the PCO2 diffuses into a bicarbonate solution around the electrode, the pH changes, and that uh, is measured. And incidentally, perhaps I should have said that the PO2 is measured by a polarographic technique, uh, where you, you have a couple of electrodes, you have a voltage difference across them in the blood, and you measure the small current that occurs. Okay, so what can cause an increased PCO2? That's what we're concerned about, CO2 retention. There are two causes of an increased PCO2. The first is hypoventilation, which of course we've talked about already, and the second is ventilation perfusion inequality. Let me just go back to hypoventilation for a moment. Of course, we use the alveolar ventilation equation, which, uh, as we saw before, gives us an inverse relationship between the PCO2 and the level of ventilation, and so that's not a difficult subject to understand. But the effects of ventilation perfusion inequality on PCO2 is a more complex su subject. There's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of misconceptions in the area, and so I'm going to go over it uh, briefly here. Let's suppose we have a normal lung which has no ventilation perfusion inequality. Now, you may say, well, there is a bit of ventilation perfusion inequality in the normal lung because of the effects of gravity. Uh, yes, that's true, but it's trivial in the context of, say, a patient with COPD. So we're going to assume that in the normal lung, we've got a situation where there is no uneven ventilation of blood flow, no ventilation perfusion inequality. And then suddenly we impose ventilation perfusion inequality on this normal lung. 
Now it doesn't matter how that's done. Uh, one example would be to take a subject, put him in one of these high performance aircraft and do a sudden turn. And uh, the g-forces are high and they will cause ventilation perfusion inequality. But I mean that's just one example. Let's, it, it doesn't matter what the example is. Let's ask the question, what happens to gas exchange if we impose uneven ventilation and blood flow on this normal situation? And the answer is that both the oxygen uptake and the CO2 output fall, and along with that, the PO2 in the blood, arterial blood falls and the PCO2 rises. Why does the oxygen uptake and the CO2 output, why do they fall when we impose ventilation perfusion inequality? The answer is, it's because the lung becomes more inefficient at gas exchange. A lung with VAQ inequality cannot transfer the same amounts of gas as a lung without VAQ inequality. And so this is an inevitable result when we impose VAQ inequality on the lung. Now, this is not a viable situation, at least over a, a, a period of time, because the lung has to transfer the amounts of oxygen and CO2 required by the metabolizing tissues. So something's got to change. You can't stay at stage two here. And what happens is that you move to stage two. You can't stay at stage one, I should have said. You, you, we now move to stage two, where the oxygen uptake and the CO2 output return to the normal values. But to do that, the PO2 has to fall even further, as shown here, and the PCO2 has to rise even further. This is a, a viable situation. In other words, the, the lung is transferring the right amounts of gas that the peripheral tissues require. And why is it that we can increase the oxygen consumption, the oxygen uptake of the lung, by reducing the PO2? Well, you can think of it as a reduction in the arterial PO2 increases the gradient, if you like, between the alveolar gas and the blood. At any event, this is a, a perfectly viable situation here, and of course there are many patients with COPD walking around who have normal oxygen uptake, CO2 outputs, they have hypoxemia, and they have some CO2 retention. But some patients don't stay at stage two, they move to stage three, which is shown here. And why is that? The reason is that the body is, quotes, very reluctant to see the PCO2 rise. Why is that? Because a rise in PCO2 changes the hydrogen ion concentration, changes the pH of the blood, and it interferes with a number of enzymes in the body. It changes the configuration of certain proteins. It uh, interferes with the central nervous system. The body is very reluctant to see the PCO2 rise. And so what very often happens is this increase in PCO2 is sensed by the chemoreceptors. They increase the ventilation of the alveoli. The net result is the PCO2 now comes back to normal, but the PO2 does not. Why does an increase in ventilation of the alveoli manage to return the CO2 to normal, but not the oxygen? Because of the different shapes of the oxygen and CO2 dissociation curves. The CO2 dissociation curve is nearly linear within the working range and therefore the high VAQ units can make up for the low VAQ units, not so for oxygen. The very non-linear oxygen dissociation curve means that the high ventilation perfusion ratio units cannot make up for the low ventilation perfusion ratio units. Now sometimes patients who are in stage three, that is, they've got COPD, they've got hypoxemia, a normal PCO2, they revert to stage two. They go back to stage two from stage three. Now, why is that? Well, in a sense, what they're doing is they're trading an increase in PCO2 for less dyspnea. In stage three, they have a big increase in ventilation, they have a lot of airway obstruction, they have a high work of breathing, and they have severe dyspnea with respiratory distress. And they would rather have less distress and tolerate an increase in PCO2.
So often these patients, sometimes these patients, will revert from stage three back to stage two where the PCO2 increases. Now sometimes these patients are referred to as hypoventilating, and that's actually quite misleading to use that term. It's often used by people who use the terms hypoventilation and PCO2 almost interchangeably. But the root cause here of the increase in PCO2 is not hypoventilation at all. As a matter of fact, these patients are moving much more air into their lungs than normal subjects. So they're not hypoventilating. The, in, the reason for the increase in PCO2 is ventilation perfusion inequality. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about the PCO2. Let's turn now to pH. And again, we dealt with the acid-based disturbances uh, at length in the respiratory physiology series, and I'm not going to go into them in detail now. Just to remind you that the critical equation is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which says that the pH is equal to the pK, a constant, 6.1, plus the log of bicarbonate over the PCO2, with a constant here. And what we immediately see from this is if we keep this ratio constant, bicarbonate to PCO2, then the pH is going to remain constant. But if we increase the PCO2, for example, uh, with uh, hypoventilation, this, the, the increase the denominator here, this is going to fall, and therefore the pH is going to fall. Now, as we know, I'm sure, uh, there are four types of acid-base disturbances. There, there can be uh, in acidosis, it can be respiratory or metabolic. Alkalosis, there can be uh, respiratory or metabolic. Respiratory acidosis is caused by hypoventilation, one example, or ventilation perfusion inequality, as we said. And there is renal compensation by increasing the bicarbonate level of the blood. Also, there can be metabolic acidosis that could be caused, for example, by diabetes. And the compensation there is to increase ventilation and reduce the PCO2. Alkalosis can be respiratory, as, for example, caused by hyperventilation. And the compensation there is to reduce the bicarbonate. Or we can have metabolic acidosis caused by loss of gastric acid, for example, in in pyloric stenosis, one example, and often there's no compensation here. So that's a very quick look at the four types of acid-based disturbances, and we're going to be looking at them in more detail as we go into the various lung diseases later on. So now I've dealt with the two most important pulmonary function tests. We've dealt with the forced expiration on the one hand, and, as, and the, uh, the uh, arterial blood gases on the other. Very important tests. There are a number of other tests, and I'm going to go through them more briefly, but we should at least mention them. The first is the measurement of the diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide. That's normally made with a single breath technique. The, the patient inhales a low concentration, perhaps 0.3% of carbon monoxide. He breath holds for 10 seconds or so, and then makes an exhalation. We discard the first part of the exhalation because it's contaminated by dead space. We collect the alveolar gas sample and we calculate the amount of CO that's been taken up during the breath holding period. And there are several causes of a reduced diffusing capacity. One of these I've already mentioned, that's a thickened blood gas barrier as we saw in uh, diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Another is a reduced area of the barrier, for example, in emphysema or in lobectomy. Uh, another is a reduced capillary blood volume because the measured diffusing capacity for carbon monoxide depends on the volume of blood in the pulmonary capillary. That can be reduced in pulmonary embolism, for example. Finally, some patients have inequality of ventilation and diffusion properties throughout the lung. An example would be COPD. And that can cause a reduction in, diffuse, in the measured diffusing capacity, uh, but it's a little bit messy, and some people prefer to use the term transfer factor rather than diffusing capacity to emphasize that diffusion is not the only factor in reducing the measured CO diffusing capacity. So sometimes you'll hear people, particularly in Europe, referring to the uh, test as t the transfer factor rather than the diffusing capacity. 
Another test that's uh, very useful sometimes is the single breath nitrogen test of un uneven ventilation. The patient takes a vital capacity breath of uh, oxygen and then exhales uh, slowly to residual volume. And the nitrogen concentration is plotted against lung volume. Initially, there's not much nitrogen in the expired gas because of the dead space, but after that's been washed out, we see what's called the nitrogen plateau, which is often nearly flat in normal subjects. In patients, however, with uneven ventilation, there's a slope in the nitrogen plateau, and the reason for that is that the poorly ventilated units uh, receive less oxygen and therefore they have a higher nitrogen concentration and also the poorly ventilated units tend to empty last and that gives us this upward slope and the slope of this can be measured and is a an index of the degree of uneven ventilation and sometimes that's a useful measurement to make. You'll see that towards the end of the expiration there was a sudden rise in the nitrogen concentration and this indicates what's called the closing volume. It's caused in normal subjects by the closure of airways at the bottom of the lung. And, and when that happens, the, uh, the uh, apex of the lung contributes the, to the expiration and that has a higher nitrogen concentration. Now the closing volume is sometimes a useful measurement to make. Uh, it, it's age dependent, it uh, increases with age, and it also increases with relatively small amounts of COPD. For example, it's sometimes possible to find a patient who is a cigarette smoker, perhaps has smoked a lot of cigarettes, whose pulmonary function tests are essentially normal, very nearly normal, but he has an increased closing volume. And so it seems to be a useful test of minor changes in the small airways. It's a, a test of, uh, believed to be a test of small airways function. Okay, let's go on now to a measurement of lung volumes. Those are often reported because they're often abnormal. We've saw, seen already that a patient with COPD has high lung volumes and a patient with interstitial fibrosis has low lung volumes. And lung volumes are often useful to measure. And this just reminds us that we can measure two of them using a simple spirometer or an electronic spirometer. Uh, we measure the tidal volume here and also the vital capacity but we can't measure the residual volume, the functional residual capacity, or the total lung capacity. And that's because the patient can't exhale the gas in the residual volume. To do that, we have to go to another technique, and one that's very frequently used is the body box, or the plethysmograph. And to measure the FRC in the plethysmograph, we have the patient inside the box, and he makes an inspiratory effort against a closed airway. He manages to rarefy the gas inside the lungs somewhat. The lung volume increases a bit and we measure the change in lung volume from the, the use of Boyle's law in the plethysmograph. Boyle's law, you recall, is that pressure and volume are inversely related for a given temperature. And so that gives us the change in volume of the lung. Then we apply Boyle's law again to the gas in the lung, we measure the pressure in the airway when he makes this inspiratory attempt, and by using Boyle's law again, we can get at the FRC. So that's a way of, that's frequently done, measuring the FRC, which for example, is usually greatly increased in COPD. Now what about other pulmonary function tests? Well, we can sometimes measure airway resistance. Now of course, we have a, me a method, we've already talked about methods of measuring airway obstruction using a forced expiration, but nevertheless, airway resistance is sometimes a useful measurement to get. And uh, that is also measured with the body box that I just showed you. I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, it's not a particularly difficult measurement to make. Another useful measurement sometimes is lung compliance. Uh, for example, patients with interstitial fibrosis have a reduced compliance. And lung compliance is measured by inserting a small balloon into the esophagus and having the patient change his lung volume and we measure the volume change per unit pressure change which is the lung compliance. 
lung compliance tends to be slightly increased in COPD and is certainly greatly reduced in patients with interstitial fibrosis. Then sometimes we're interested, we, we, we want to know about the control of ventilation and we can measure the ventilatory response to CO2 or the ventilatory response to hypoxia by having the patient breathe in and out of a bag and we measure the, uh, the, the change in ventilation as the CO2 changes or the oxygen level changes. And finally, sometimes we use exercise tests and this is because the lung has a great deal of reserve at rest and sometimes uh, pulmonary function is not seriously impaired at rest but by using exercise tests we can bring out the limitations uh, because of the changes in lung function. So exercise tests are useful from time to time. Finally, what are the uses of pulmonary function tests? Well, they're certainly they give us supporting information in diagnosis. They're, they're rarely the critical measurement in diagnosis, but certainly they can give supporting information. For example, suppose we have a patient with suspected diffuse interstitial pulmonary fibrosis and we measure the carbon monoxide diffusing capacity and it's normal. Then that would give us pause. That would raise an eyebrow or two because that we, we might want to look back at the uh, diagnosis again and if uh, again but the same uh, token if we measured the compliance of the lung in that patient and it was normal again that would give us pause so the 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 pulmonary function tests are useful sometimes as additional information in the diagnosis of lung disease they're particularly useful in assessing the efficacy of bronchodilator drugs and this is chiefly in patients with asthma who have bronchoconstriction are being treated with bronchodilator drugs and it's very important to see how useful these drugs are, the extent to which they reduce the airway obstruction and, and that's done during the forced, ex, the forced expiration test that we talked about and that's a very important use of pulmonary function tests. Sometimes tests are used for assessing patients for surgery. For example, a patient has a carcinoma of the lung and you want to remove uh, a lobe or even two lobes, whatever, and uh, it's important to know whether the lung, whether the patient is going to tolerate that and what his quality of life would be like afterwards because very often these patients have some COPD as well, they're usually smokers, and uh, it's sometimes not clear whether they can tolerate removal of a lobe. Workers' compensation is another important uh, area. Uh, people working in some industrial process exposed to dust, uh, compensation issues may arise. And finally, epidemiological studies are important. We're looking at the prevalence of disease in a community, increasingly done now, and uh, simple lung function tests are important there. So that's all I'm going to say about pulmonary function tests, but let me just leave you with one final thought and that is that pulmonary function tests are useful of course and, that's, and we're certainly justified in spending a period on them as we've done. But in fact it's much more important for people to understand the way diseased lungs function, understand the principles of function in lung disease than simply concentrate on pulmonary function tests. And in the next few lectures we're going to be looking at the way in which pulmonary function is altered by various types of lung disease and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye for now.